Right, gents, thanks for um, joining me. Craig, first of all, let's start with you. What have you been up to during lockdown? Oh, um, not a great deal, to be honest. Been, uh, been at the club probably about once a week, uh, just check, checking that uh, everything's okay up there. Um, had a couple of uh, instances early in the lockdown where a couple of kids got in and were on the 3G with a quad bite, which was uh, not very good news. Um, Fortunately, there was no damage, but uh, yeah, so um, just keeping an eye on it really, and uh, not a lot else to be honest. Keep yourself just working away, like I said, uh, said the earlier, nothing's really changed for me in terms of Royal Mail since the put us into being key workers. Um, we have literally never been, we've never been as busy now as we've ever been. It's like in my office at the minute, it's like Christmas for the last five weeks. Mm. We've been inundated with packets, but we can only do what we can do on a, on a daily basis. But yeah, it's been really busy for me. And yourself and family all okay? All okay. You know, my mum and dad's obviously back in Northern Ireland, and uh, my boys were, uh, you know, they've been furloughed. But yeah, everybody, fingers crossed, everybody's good. You know, I we'll hope it stays that way. And Craig, yourself? Um. Yeah, family's okay. Um, I lost my aunt last weekend, unfortunately. Um, she'd uh, been poorly for a little while, but um, unfortunately, due to the frustration, the uh, death certificate's got COVID on it, which um, really uh, pisses me off, quite frankly, because uh, she didn't have COVID, <laughs> full stop. She was tested. She went. She was put in hospital two and a half weeks ago. Um, she was in a care home before that. And uh, she was struggling with her breathing. And uh, they took her in and they tested her and she was negative. Uh, they tested her four days later and she was negative. And they tested her again a third time and she was in there and she was negative. Um, she didn't eat for 10 days. She was on a drip. She was a poor little frail lady, really. And um, she, um, I spoke to the sister last Friday evening and she said, yeah, unfortunately we're, we're just, she's sleeping. We're just waiting for her to pass naturally sort of thing. Um, but you do know she's got COVID. And I said, well, the last test, the third test only a few days ago came back negative. What do you mean she's got COVID? Uh, and she said, well, the x-rays, chest x-rays show that she's got it. So I said, well, you know, you've just told me she's asleep. She's not been on any breathing apparatus. She's not, um, she's not on any medication. She's not on no painkillers. Absolutely nothing. Um, just peacefully laying there, waiting to pass. And um, and she goes down as one of the COVID statistics. Which, you know, from my point, you know, she's she's she needed to go anyway. She didn't have anybody, any family. She had dementia. She didn't have a life really, but. You know, it's worrying that what is going on in this world as to, you know, when I said to the nurse, well, how can she have three negative tests? And yet she's positive. And she said, well, the tests are not reliable. Now, my view is, what is the whole world doing testing everybody if they're not reliable? It just doesn't make sense. It's just mm. ludicrous. But um, so that's, that's concerning as to what is going on in the outside world when you hear first hand of something that is not right. So I suppose know. we can take that into a football context with potentially players coming back and stuff and supposedly getting tested. If those yeah. tests are not reliable, it's not necessarily going to be perfect, yeah. is it? Totally. And and testing NHS workers proving that they're negative so as they can go back to work when technically the tests are not reliable, they tell me and, and they could be positive. So mm. I, no, I don't know. Try and overthink it, can't you? Too much. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, let's let's start about the um about the league season then, Keith. Um, we only obviously lost three games all season, and two of those were against Malden, which was obviously runaway league, leaders in the end. Um, how did you find the league season as a whole for us this year? Um, I have to remind you, obviously, the other game we lost, we missed three penalties. In that yeah, game. I was gonna, I, I've got <laughs> notes for that. I was going to mention that. Yeah, the freak result you against Cogshaw. Co 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 well, uh, yeah. Looking back on the season, um, obviously when I came into the club, a few a few league games in, you know, I came over and watched the FA Cup game, and in all honesty, 
you know, after we played Malden at home, me and Craig had a long, long conversation after the game about what we needed to do. And I actually did think at that time we had a bit of, I had a bit of work on my hands to do. You know, I thought I'd more work than what I did. But when I got on the training ground and started to get into a few games, and to be fair, the uh, Velocity Cup was good for me at the time because I could change the system without having any pressure of a league game. And we just tinkered with it a little bit, just changed the system, and the players took to it. And from then on in, you know, we started to really pick up a bit of momentum and a bit of confidence, you know, and that helps a lot for the players, just to have a, lot, a little bit of confidence. And for me, uh, it, was, it was enjoyable. Greg, your take on it? Just, just a shame that um, we didn't really uh, get what we probably deserved, and that was a, at least a stab at the playoffs. You know, I'm, I'm convinced we have 11 league fixtures left, games in hand on the others around us, Lane in second spot. Um, we, we were assured of a playoff spot, you know, and, um, and the way we were going, quite likely a home one, and our home record's very good. Um, and it would have been nice to have at least had the opportunity to have... Um, Try to got that promotion uh, spot, yeah. But the, yeah. the league, the league form was was fantastic. You know, some great entertaining games over at Parkside all season, um, and uh, and done a job away from home. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I do believe, I do believe as well that we would have had the, the we we had the crowd coming back into the grounds as well. I, I do believe if we'd have had two two playoff games. Hopefully at home, that was the key to it. There have been good, there have been two good gates, you know, or uh, especially on if we'd have got to a playoff final, it would have been a good crowd at Averley because we started to, the crowd started to pick up as well, you know. And I suppose it would have been an ideal date because that would have been a Friday night as well. So a lot of people would have, would have been off work Saturdays maybe. So probably would have enticed even more in on that day. Well, not me. I'd have had to go <laughs> to work Saturday morning. <laughs> probably with a hangover. But, uh, yeah, it's all ifs and buts, isn't it? You know, and like Craig has, has touched on it, you know, the ruling didn't actually go our way, you know, in terms of what we hoped for. So we have to start again. You know, the, the, we have to uh, agree with what the league have done and just get on with next season and, and pick up and do better next season. You know, and that, that we have to take the positives, that's for sure. Um, a lot of teams, obviously, when they have got the league and then they have a separate cap run, it can sort of have a detriment effect to the league. But I suppose our cap run didn't, did it, this season? Do you know what? It was um, it was one and a half for me because it was so many games. We played so many games in and around a certain period that we were struggling to fit league games in. Yeah. And especially at home, you know, we, we, lo we lost a lot of league games at home during that run. Uh, and then obviously in amongst that run we played a lot of away games mm. and, and yeah but it's well documented listen we, we spoke about it a lot this season the cup run you know but I will I always say to the players that the cup was theirs to have a go at but the league was mine you know the league, the league I'm judged on where we are in the league the cup run was for the players I think I remember going back to a conversation at East Grinstead where you said you just wanted to win that game just to get a cup win for, for win for the club. I suppose I suppose at that moment no one would have thought we would have gone as far as we did. Yeah, Do you know, it was a bit of a, we had to go to East Grinstead during the week. Um, we were driving there and we got the minibus there. And I was more concerned that it was that it was players were going to get lost or get late because of the travelling on our own to get to East Grinstead. It's not the easiest place to get to. And when I walked in the changing room. Everybody was there. Every single player was there. They were all on the pitch. We were actually the ones who were late, due to Craig. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, for me, the East Grinstead game was the one that was the pressure for me. And then after that, I did feel that. I did feel that when we when we drew Bowers, people forget about that game as well. I did feel that I, we, I needed to get through that one as well. You know, I, I wanted to win two at least to get. And then the Bowers game. People forget that game, how well we played with 10 men. And for me, like I said, that was the only time I felt a little bit under pressure to get a result. The club didn't put me under pressure. 
I put myself on that pressure to, to win them games. That's for sure. Craig, what was the, the run like for the, for the club as a whole? Obviously, great from a, from a financial perspective. We, uh, we, we got more prize money there than we've done uh, ever, I believe, in any FA Cup competition. In any FA competition. Shame it wasn't the FA Cup because I think we'd have had about six times the amount, but um, <laughs> all very nice. And obviously, with the, the circumstances we're in at the moment, um, you know, we might be relying on some of that as well, depending on how long uh, this goes on for. But uh, the, the sad thing about it was the fact that how good a, a run we had, um, people tend to forget that from the Horn Church, when it really sort of gained momentum was the, the car show and win at home, I think, um, and especially then the Horn Church win in the new year. And we didn't have one league Saturday fixture at home after that win. And I just feel that we took a lot of supporters over at Horn Church, a lot of people that I hadn't seen for a long, long while, and that continued. Um, they were there for the Chelsea game on the Saturday, a big crowd for that day, and we took like over 500 ourselves to Notts County, which was fantastic. And those people, I think a lot of those that were coming to those cup games would have eventually started coming to the league games as well had they been on Saturdays. But all we ended up playing, if you remember, was we played Berry on a Monday night, we played Felix Day on a Monday night, we played Basildon on a Monday, Brentwood on a Monday. Mm. So just the way the trophy was set up this year, um, and it could have gone the other way because it could have been we'd have been losing away fixtures, but every round that we got through was another fixture at home on a Saturday that we lost that got moved over to the um, to a Monday night. So that was frustrating because it's not only, you know, the, the bigger crowd on the Saturday, but when you're successful, if you're getting 250, which we were, that could quite easily have turned into 300, 350 by the time we were getting towards back end of the season. Mm. Um, and then you'd hope, obviously, to, to take that forward into next year, where I feel that the whole of non-league football is really going to be starting again when it when it starts up. And people will... The, the trophy really becomes a bit of a distant memory, and you just hope that we can get off to a flyer whenever that may be and to reignite and try and build on, on the previous season. I didn't realise myself. That, that, was the only, that was the only downside of the trophy. That, and, and, you know, that's... That's a minute thing, but the the upsides of it far outweighed it. Like there was, you know, near enough as Keith's touched there, every game, bearing in mind that we are of the lowest level of people that go into the trophy, our level, you know, to win, I think we played eleven games in the end with two or three replays in there. But wins like, you know, the the Taunton one was the one that done it for me. I think not only the character um, that we showed down there and the belief and the like, togetherness. But that bus ride home, I think, pushed us on more than any game did this season. The, the atmosphere on the bus and everything, um, you know, a long old journey. And I think that gave us a lot of togetherness as a team and as a club and which we, we built on and went through. Do you agree with that, Keith? Yeah, yeah. Do, do you know what? As well as that, and I'll touch on the Nuts County game in a minute, but for me, I thought when we came in after the game at Car Short, and we obviously we went 3 0 up, and then they came back into the game and it was 3 all. You know, I walked into that change room after that game, and you know, one or two of the boys, it, the atmosphere was a bit low in the change room after that. And I thought it was my job to pick them up. And I, and I, my words were, you know, their best player was their goalkeeper. Mm. on the day and we scored three goals and you know I think Connor said to me but Gav, you know Gaffro we freed it up should have scored it but I went I don't care at the end of the day we're going to we're going to have a Monday night replay and we started that game on the Monday night in the same vein and again it was another football club who had no complaints it's like I said it's like I said that when we when we played Carl Short at their place, when I was in the bar after, I felt that their attitude towards us was, you know, they never, every team almost pretty much said that they didn't play well against us. Maybe we actually played really well. 
And I thought we were, that first half against Carl Shorten, I thought we were outstanding. Mm. Absolutely outstanding. We could have been five. And it's literally after, after half time, it could have been five. You know, and that's just the way the game went on the day. You know, but when you've got two lads up top in terms of George Stakes and Alex Coffey, you know, they're going to score goals. They're going to make chances. And it was just our, what we did against Cross Shark, we learned to keep a clean sheet in the second game. And that was it. We were always going to score goals, and that was it for me. As soon as we went 2 0 up against Cross Shark, they were getting a goal back. And we won that game again comfortably. With the, um, the the cup run as well, Keith, I obviously I suppose we get a bit of a name for ourselves um, sort of on social media and stuff. Did you get sort of many ex, ex players you played with contacting you, giving you good luck and stuff? And well, put it this way, I'm not particularly keen on the social media. Carry on. <laughs> this is not even my phone I'm using. But um, yeah, oh, listen, yeah, I had a lot of people ring me up saying well done and that you know, but. The the game at you know the game at Nats County people don't realise you know obviously we won the Nats County and on the day you know it, it, the game itself was a little bit of a disappointment the ninety minutes but what people didn't realise is that on the day and I've thought this through quite a lot being a manager because it's the first thing I do is could I have done something better technically and I look at it and think I had Georgie Allen sitting on the bench probably the best centre half our level but he was coming back from injury so my my view was how can I get George George Allen on the pitch but if I'm putting George Allen on the pitch what do I do with Jack Potter now Jack was outstanding in that run of games so I can't drop Jack so Jack has to push in the midfield now if I push Jack in the midfield what do I do with Jason Rad? for three months he was untouchable in that position on the left hand side and young Wan Reid was 19 years of age, was brilliant against Horn Church and excellent against Paul Shorten and um, Chelmsford. So then do I look to take one of the strikers off the pitch? Now I'm going to take George Sykes off the pitch or Alex Crawford. So I couldn't fit 12 players onto the pitch. Mm. So I literally didn't, I sort of tucked that defeat on the chin because if I'd have had to change it technically, I'd have had to take one of them players off that pitch now. Probably Craig would be the same thing as me. That would have been very harsh on them 11 players. Very harsh. And for me, George Allen was coming back from an injury. So, you know, I was damned if I do and I was damned if I didn't. And I do sometimes think that if I'd have changed it and been a bit more ruthless in that game, we might have lost as, as heavily as we did. But you know what? I couldn't have done it to one of them players. Mm. who'd done, done that for over nine or ten games for me, I couldn't have done it, you know? No, that's it. I agree. Looking, um, obviously, going on towards next season, whenever that's going to start, going to start. well, obviously, there's been a couple of additions. We've John Coventry coming in as to help with the backroom staff, and obviously, we've got a new kit man as well. Um, how did that all come about with John, first of all? Um, I'll just say, it was, it was actually Craig who spoke to me about John, and I've known John for... 15 seasons now I think it is and um, you know John became John uh, wanted to be involved and um, from my point of view Craig and me thought it was a complete no-brainer and I'll hand this one over to Craig now but obviously I'd, I'd have a ch chat about it after again but yeah it was, it was Craig sort of spoke to me about it um, and I thought it was a, a no-brainer really basically Craig? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when Keith came in, he, he brought Joe Keith in as, as number two with Jordan Jack, um, part of the management team. Um, and then Joe left after probably about three weeks or so. And um, and we, we went with it. Keith said, like, he didn't feel that it was um, necessarily anybody out there that fitted what uh, he wanted to bring in at the time. Um, Obviously, I've known John a long while through football, like most people have in the area, and I knew that he'd uh, come away from East Thurrock and been chatting with him at the bar because he's quite a regular over at Parkside for our games and all games. Um, 
and got a, got the feeling that he, he there was unfinished business with him that he wasn't going to like literally retire. So um, I sowed the seed with Keith and and uh, suggested did we uh, feel that another member of the the management team was was required to to give us another little push and uh, take us forward. Um, Keith was like quite happy. Like I suggested John. I said I didn't know obviously if if he was up for that, but um, you know, and Keith was very keen to pursue it. So we set a meeting up and the three of us had a chat um, and it, it went well. And John, to his credit, he didn't jump in. He'd had other offers as well. Uh, he didn't jump in and accept it straight away. When he time to think, which, you know, you respect him for doing that because then you'd like to think you make the right decision if, um, if you take your time. And uh, we left him and uh, after a couple of weeks, he, uh, he gave us a call and, and accepted it. And, uh, and now, you know, I'm sure like everybody else, Keith, John, a whole of the management team and, and everybody, fans alike, are just itching and can't wait to get going again. I suppose, Keith, John brings a, uh, a yellow pages of, of contact in Essex football as well. So that'll be good for us as well. Yeah, listen, he's, um, he, knows, he knows Essex football through and through, you know. Uh, for me, it was never a case of... Listen, I work with the two boys, Jack and George, you know, and they're, they're great lads and they're learning the game and they know they're learning the game. So from my point of view, I spoke to them about it as well. And like I said to John at the time, when we went, there's no role, there's no title, you know. You know, obviously I'm managing the football club, but at the same time, I just said to John, it's like I said to Joe Keith at the same time as well, you know, I'd give you, you can take a training session, you, can, you know, I'm always up, for uh, taking advice at any point, and I'll talk. I'll speak to anybody about that. But I just thought I, I just said to John, you know, don't overthink it. You know, he didn't want to take a role in a football club where he was going to be sent out every Saturday to watch a game of football or watch players. He still wanted to be involved on the Saturday because it's in our blood. And from my point of view, I just said to him, listen, you'll be on the sideline with me every Saturday, along with Jack and George, and I'm never. As long as I never put any emphasis on it's all about me, as you well know. Mm. So, from my point of view, I'm a great believer in if it's we're all off the same page in terms of you know the players are very focused on where the vocal points coming from. Uh, that's as good as it gets, really, for me. You know, and the players, the players know John. You know, and. He's a, he's a great lad and he's a football man. So from my point of view, it was a complete no-brainer to turn around and, and bring and try and get John on board with us because it was probably maybe a bit harder for him to maybe think about coming in as a, as a coach you know, because he's been a manager for so long. Mm -hmm. But I just said to him, listen, come and enjoy it. It's like I said to Joe, Joe with me at the time, and I've said this to the two boys, and I said it on a regular basis to him, are you enjoying it? Because that's the whole thing. And that's one thing I've learned over the last X amount of years now being a manager, that if you don't enjoy it, um, if you don't enjoy it, if, if you're winning games of football and you've got a good group around you, you enjoy it. And to be, to be fair to that group, I've got the really, 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 in the changing room, they're, they're a great bunch. They really are. And I couldn't overemphasize that enough to John when I was saying, you know, about the, obviously the facility sells itself, itself, the ground sells itself. But from my point of view, I was selling it to John, the point that that change room I've got with them lads and that change room, they're a good, good bunch. Probably one of the, along with probably a few seasons in Braintree, probably as good a group as I've had in terms of camaraderie and how well they get on together. And to be fair, how, how hard they work, you know, as well. And they're always up, they're, they're keen to learn and listen as well. And that was the key point to it. Yeah, and they all seem to sort of they seem to be more of a family than teammates as well, which is quite good. They all get on, and it's uh, well. The uh, funny thing is, on a Thursday night, I'm one of the first to leave because I get a Chinese. <laughs> so I think, I think the important the thing there, I think the important thing is as well to stress that he's you know John, he, I picked up on straight away. You said he's obviously got a, a plethora of numbers in the, in his little book sort of thing, and it, that's not something that. It, it, we're looking to do as a football club at all. We've got what well, is a very good squad of players here, and 
probably needs one or two bits tinkering around, Keith, to to maybe take it to the next level. That's the whole idea. There's certainly not going to be, how I see it, mm. wholesale changes on the playing side whatsoever. No. Listen, Craig, it's like we've spoken about nine to ten. I'm not the type of person that goes out and works for 50 players a season. I, f- I felt when I came into the club, um, we needed a centre forward. One thing I picked up on more than anything watching that FA Cup game is that I couldn't work out where Alex was playing. Was he playing to the side of the pitch or was he up front? And the one thing I'd done straight away was try and get Alex through the middle of the pitch. But he needed somebody to work with him. And George Sykes was a fantastic boy for him. Absolutely. The two of them, probably the, the best two strikers in the league. Mm. They were unplayable at times. But the, the thing what I found was as well, obviously I listened to people's opinions. Like I mean, you spoke a lot in length after the Malden game at home when we lost 2-1. But I thought I'd go with it. I thought I'd, I'd, I'd give Jack Mocker a run with it. Funny enough, Jack got it in it right back to start with and, and, and Harry Gibbs and how well Harry stepped up to the plate when Georgie Allen got injured. So from my point of view, I've never worked with big, I've never worked with 40, 40 odd players a season. It's not me. In fact, Craig was probably more the thinking that I needed to go and get more players towards the end. <laughs> where I was thinking, this group will do me fine. Yeah. But we are not. I'm not the type of manager, and I, I do believe that if you if you bring continuity, and you do work with players, and they enjoy working with you, they they won't want to go anywhere. No. And I think I've got a group. I've got a group at the ground. And I hope I've got a group of players, a key group of players of 14 or 15 that wouldn't go anywhere because we're in our league with the go-to that, that's not as, as good as what we, we are, you know? Yeah. And, and Craig, the addition obviously off the pitch with, with Ricky coming in to replace Terry with the, the kit stuff. Yeah. Um, I'll hand that one over to Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I spoke to Ricky a couple of times last year on a personal level and knew that he was doing um, the kit side of it at Holbridge and, uh, and by all accounts, like, does it very, very well. And it's, it's, it's just young blood coming into the club, enthusiastic. You know, the boy can't wait to get going. Um, Terry, Terry needs to come in and have a sandwich and uh, half a shandy and sit in the ballroom and, and enjoy a game, you know. Um, He's already taken um, a back step as far as a match secretarial role during the season. Um, and that particular uh, role has, has ended up falling on my shoulders uh, of late. But I've also got somebody in the pipeline that's going to come in and do that as well. So off the pitch as well, we've strengthened the team from the club's point of view, which is great news, mm. uh, with a couple of good additions in there as well. Can't really say too much about Matt Secretary 1, but um, hopefully we can we can reveal that this week as such. But, um, yeah, so really good news all round on, on that side of it. Just, it's not so obviously for next season, then it's all set up to be ambitious, I guess, off on, on and off the pitch. When we get going. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's... Um, the frustrating thing is, is you know, curtailing this season and and making a decision on it from the FA's point of view when we don't really know when we're going to start is, um, you know, I, I just think people have egg on their face. If we don't start playing football again until the new year, then we could have continued with this season and, and played it to a finish. Um, and then, because what happens next year, if we kick off in January the 1st with a new league season, we'll end up playing half a season. Mm-hmm. Um, or what happens if we start earlier than that? We start October and we get a, a second, third, fourth wave of this pandemic. And, you know, it's all massive ifs and, ifs and buts. But I just feel from a from an FA point, point of view, I was very frustrated. I thought the National League had massively the right idea. Um, I was all in favour personally of uh, finishing the season, drawing a line under it. Um, but waiting until football in general made a decision on whether it was going to go points per game, weighty points per game, null and void or whatever. Um, and I think it's left itself wide open here with the Football League now this week saying that they could go 
points per game, which you can then see the conference possibly or the National League going the same way. Um, and we should all have done the same thing. Mm. And there was no rush. There was never no need to rush into a null and void season, my personal opinion. Uh, but that's what it is. We, uh, we have to dust ourselves off, go again and be ready for, for when it um, actually comes. And, and hopefully we'll, um, we'll give a good fist of it and carry on where we left off. Yeah, I think you're, you're spot on that one, Craig. I think there was no need to rush. There was no need for it. Where, where, where were we going? Nobody's going yeah. anywhere. There was yeah. no, um, you know, and I think you, we should have maybe been guided about from what was coming from above us, really. But to make that decision, but listen, I'm a mere manager, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. We just had, had to break. we just had to accept the ruling. And it's like, it's like we, we obviously we're all sitting around speaking about it more than doing than the actions, but at the same time, I've got to be I've got to take it off for the positive note, and we've got to look to improve on this season finish, and look to improve. And I think like Craig said as well, we've we've improved off the pitch as well. I think John is a fantastic addition to to the group I've got. To our, to our squad, the players, uh, obviously a new kit man and stuff like that. So we're, the club, we're all ready to go. We're all, and I'm sure the players are itching to get back in, you know. And it's a strange time for us all, really, you know. And, and I think what we don't want to do is get, get into a position where it's, um, it's going to drag on and on because it's not, it's not healthy for everybody as well. You know, we've got all these young lads who want to play football, are keen to get going again, but we're going to have to draw a line and get going again at some stage. Mm. When that is, I'm hoping sooner the better. I don't know what Craig's view on that is, but at the same time, you know, obviously we're not going to start next week, but when do we start? That's the thing you say. How do you get 22 players on a football pitch, physical contact, and do it within safe Boundaries, mm. you know, how do we do it? Well, they're starting back in Germany today as well, aren't they? So I don't know how that's all going to go because they, yeah, you know, it's all now, isn't it? Yeah, that'll be interesting. I know it's behind closed doors, but like I said, from my point of view, we can sit now and reminisce all we want about last season and how great it was, you know. And I was, I was pleased as punch when I got the job. And the funny thing is, um. We can all look back on the cup run for for years to come because for many, like I said, I I, I felt that's currently for me was the hardest one I had because I knew I was going to have to take that result on the chin. I knew on the way up there, I knew before the game kicked off, but we we tried to be as positive as, as we could. But for me, I just felt that the Horn Church game, the Cor Shorten game, I mean, Craig's right. When we went down to Taunton, we didn't have to play well. And we matched a physical team and there. They or they were probably one of the best teams we played. They were well well organized, fantastic centre forward. And Jack Mocker and Harry Gibbs never gave him a kick hardly. Mm -hmm. You know? After we sorted out the the aerial duels with them. But for me, you know, as a as a person and as a manager, I kept saying to Craig, you know, and, and Graham, because he, obviously Graham as well, I kept saying, if we get through this round, what a fantastic achievement. If we get to the last 16, what a fantastic achievement. If we get to the last eight, well, you know, it's history making. Mm. So from a, from a personal point of view, an achievement, it's a massive achievement for myself. And, you know, at that, in the same breath, you know, um, we all have people behind us, you know. Like I, I've got Monica and my two boys. Like Monica knows them players inside out. Because when I come home on Saturday night, she's known who's tackled, who's done it. But sometimes she actually talks me around. You know, she, she does. She, she's she's a good. She gives me fantastic advice, and I'm sure Craig gets that off Lynn as well. You know, we we have to have somebody to bounce stuff off, and. Like I said, I give Monica a special mansion and my two boys as well. You know, my two boys stood behind the dugout against Hornchurch, stood behind the dugout against Chelmsford, and 
them three people were the first three people I looked for after the game finished the final whistle, you know, my two boys and Monica, because there was probably nobody more pleased for me than them three. You know, it, it, it was really, I was really proud. The Horn Shirts game, and I'm sure Craig was really proud of that day as well, you know. But I did think... I think there was tears, Craig, wasn't there? <laughs> that yeah, was quite satisfying. I was, I was a little bit concerned with Chelmsford that it was going to turn into the Lord Mayor show. That it was a big gate. It, it was a fantastic afternoon. It was, the sun was out. And I was watching the players warm up. And I pulled them in and said, listen, boys, you can win this against Chelmsford. We can win it against Chelmsford. I don't think it's set up well enough against us. And I just felt that we could win it. But they had to focus on the game. Don't worry about what's going on around you or who's in the ground watching it. Focus on the game. It's a one-off game and we can win it. You know, we, like I said to them, all the free hits had run out by then. We were in it, we were in it to win it that day at home against Chelmsford. But like I said, from a personal note, I'll hand over to Craig, but from a personal note, I just felt that the, the Horn Church game, you know, and, and, and Chelmsford, for me, was two against local rivals that we stood up. And on the, on the two games, we were the best team by far, you know, in two very different games of football. Craig? I, I think um, the pleasing thing of the trophy run for me was playing teams such as the, the Tauntons and the, and, and the Notch Counties to go to places like that and to get the respect from those particular clubs and their fans yeah. is yeah, huge. Absolutely. You know, and it's put our football club, our little football club, firmly on the map when, you know, fair play to Taunton, their, their management team, three of them, I believe it was, done the interview afterwards, and every one of them was extremely gracious in defeat, you know, gave us full credit, etc. You know, these guys have come on a Monday night like a long, long way, and to a team that really they probably felt on paper they should be beating, they would have been pig sick at losing that. And they stood there and gave us full credit. And ever since then, the Taunton fans have been fantastic. They followed us all the way through. They still sort of comment on tweets and, and, and all sorts on social media. Um, and that, that's fantastic to have that kind of knowledge in the West Country of, of, of us being yeah. in the South East. And, and then we go to Notch County and, and every tweet and every poll that goes up on Twitter, if you look at the likes or whatever, it's full of Notch County people all the time. And what those people, who are obviously very good football people and, and can acknowledge things, the fact that they stood there, and yes, it's easy because they've beaten us and they're into the semi-final of the trophy, but the, the, the stand innovation from the main stand, which I didn't see like everybody else until Steve both and actually put that up sort of a day or two later, was incredible. And like, you know, that still brings hairs on the back of my neck now to this day. When you watch it, it, it's like you know you can't repeat those sort of things. You you got to you got to live for those those sort of days. Mm, yeah, totally agree. Um, and then I suppose the last bit for us then is is just going forward in regards to off the pitch. Um, there's been we saw sort of fans and the noise and stuff get a bit more as the season went on. Um, what things are you expecting from that side of things for the new year? Like, what things would you like or? What initiatives would you like to bring in to try and drive up the success, I suppose? Well, I think initiatives is, is you know, we're always open for people coming up with ideas, etc. But it, this is this is a, a longer break than we'll be than we've ever had before. Um, certain things have, have, won't be the same, nowhere near. You know, people talk about money in football and money in businesses and sponsorships and all sorts. So fundraising. Is, is going to be vital moving forward. And that's not necessarily meaning people putting their hand in their own pocket week in, week out, etc. But it's just being a family together and coming up with ideas and trying to and find ways to bring more people into the club, which ultimately generates money, whatever way you look at it. Uh, whether that be by attending race nights, quiz nights that we put on, um, or whether it's getting the odd sponsor that's prepared to do something, you know, then, you know, we're all eyes and ears and, and, and happy to, to listen to anybody that wants to take any initiative forward. And then Keith, I guess on the pitch for you guys, it's just make as much noise as possible, is it? Yeah. Um, I've got this, the, the, the off the field stuff 
Craig's well and Graham have well got that in hand, you know what I mean? So the football side of things for me, it's just, again, it's all, it's all frustrating, you know, it is very frustrating. Uh, but one thing I will say before we, before we pack up, we're going to have to have mention these taps in the background, all right? Yeah, I was, I was about to get to that. Yeah, I was about all to right, get to okay, that. Because I want to, if any of these both young lads, football lads are watching this, players, it'll just be a little reminder that I actually was a half decent player with another bad left foot. Craig will even remember that, I think. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, the, 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 the ground itself is a fantastic um, setup. It's just that they. It needs that maybe a little bit of a personal touch in the change rooms and stuff. But it's very difficult when you ground share with other people because you don't want stuff damaged and stuff like that, you know, at the same time. But uh, from my point of view, it's just about, for me, it's just about getting back into the football. And as soon as we start talking about coming back in, this is when I start, I start when talking to the players again, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a real unique position we're in and it's not in any way good. Uh, so it, it's it's just a bit of an odd time for everybody concerned, you know, the players like, for instance, Jason Rad, you know, we got him home before this lockdown, you know, because he'd been he'd been basically lost his job, you know, and we, if any of the young lads, the best way to say it is if any of them young lads have got a problem or an issue, I would like to think that they could ring us up and talk to us about it because. That's what we're here for. You know, we're older people, we've been around. And if, you know, everybody keeps talking about the mental health side of this thing, the, the mental mental side of this issue, this pandemic, could be a big thing in the end for the younger people. So from my point of view, if any of your lads well, they have an issue or a problem, they could, there would be, I would, I, I would hope they would like to pick the phone up to me, you know, because I, I would listen to them. Yeah, so it's a big from thing. That it's, point big, of view, it's a big yeah. thing, not necessarily in sporting, just in life at the minute, isn't it? Mental health is a huge yeah, thing. So yeah, very much so. You know, very much so. And like I said, when when you manage a football team, you take on not only the the player, but you'd like to think you you, you take on the the person themselves. You know, and that, that's one thing I've really learned over the last seasons when I especially the management side of it. So the coaching side of it you could switch off. But when I went into the management side of it, you you almost become like a psychiatrist of times with players knowing when they're coming through the door what type of that what type of mentality they're in. So you almost try and read people, you know, as a person and like I said, and then when you go home you have to bounce off people, you know, I less was saying about I can't give Monica enough credit for what she does for me. And the two boys are the same because you, I have to sound off the old time. And if, if nobody listens to me, where do I go with my problems with football side of things? You know, because yeah. it doesn't all go swimmingly. You know what I mean? There is times when you know being a football manager can be a you're on your own. You know, and but but like I said, there's been. There's been less of it as this season, you know. That group of players, uh, I always say this in football, that group of players have never given me a sleepless night. You know what I mean? And, and, mm. and the, the, I've never had to pick a phone call up and a player's been in trouble away from football. They're all they're a good group. So they deserve credit as well for what the players deserve credit for what we've done this season. You know, yeah. and, and I can't give them enough credit, to be fair. Right, let's touch on the shirts then. Right, well, so well, we, one thing before oh, Keith says that. Yeah. yeah, we'll leave that for Keith's big finale shirt. <laughs> <laughs> He's, um, one thing you said about um, initiatives, etc. cetera, is um, one thing that we did start to get going towards the end before the lockdown was um, little working parties and stuff like that. What I would say is if there's anybody out there, please, that has got a couple of hours to spend, it, it does need a bit of TLC up there at the moment because where the paths are not being walked on, etc., the weeds are starting to come through, etc. So a social distance working party would be uh, would be great at uh, at some point in the near future. Why not? You get it in the fresh air as well, then, don't you? As well, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna end with you're the, you're the shoot. Jerry, to pour a few pints, Craig. Are you? I haven't got any pints, mate. <laughs> 
<laughs> everything, everything's drained down and sadly um, got a few bottles going, but uh, a few yeah. bottles, yeah. yeah. So if we touch on the shirts then, Keith. Um, two, yeah, I'll do it just two seconds, bro, yeah. with me. I'll also get something else, hang on. Don't go anywhere. Uh, Right, ready? Yeah. I'm back in the room. Right, ready? Where's Craig? <laughs> <laughs> I will just put me tossel out of the way. Can you see it? We never used to get individual caps. We got seasons. 1967 to 68. <laughs> no, 97, 98. Uh, Upside <laughs> Um, so last week um, and a couple of weeks ago, I was doing a chat with one of the some of the players, and one of the questions that came come up was, um, "Who's the best player that you've seen play live?" So Craig, you can have that question, but Keith, who's the best player you've played against? Best player I've played against um, probably would be. I'll take this off now. Do me her. Uh, don't know. It's difficult. That's a real difficult one for me because obviously. I had four and a half seasons in the Premiership and eight odd years with Northern Ireland, you know. You come up against so many, so many players. You know, um, and my career was an average career in all honesty, you know. I, I, so for me, it, it, it was almost like with people like Cantona and people like that, they, were, they, had, they had a presence about them. Mm. You know, you'd walk on the pitch and you, you knew you were going to be in for a hard afternoon with these type of players because... Not only were they exceptional talents, but they were also like the present. They were big, big lumps as well. You know, there were, there were lads you'd go up against and think, you know, fantastic players, but they had they had that something had that something special about them. You know, mm. but I will tell you one story. That I'll, I'll, I will tell you one story before we leave. That and this will be on my gravestone. That George Best knew my name. I played in Billy Bingham's testimonial against Newcastle over at Windsor Park, full house. George comes up the track at half time. And he's, I'm playing left back for Northern Ireland against Newcastle, Kevin Keegan's Newcastle. So it was early, it was pre season. So George has come up the, the track and he was back in the days, this was when he was quite healthy, you know. And um, so he comes on the pitch and comes straight over to me and I'm thinking, what's he doing? What's George doing? So he comes straight over to me, hugs me, and goes, how you doing, Keith, you all right? And after that, that was me. I, I went on the, we went into the bar after, and my dad was at the bar. So I straight up to my dad and said, Dad, do you know George Who did he Best think you were, Keith? Sorry? Who did he think you were? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's enough. <laughs> so don't be stealing my thunder, Craig. So he literally, so I walked into the bar and said to my dad, Dad, you know, George Best knew my name. And I went, oh, no, my dad was like, oh, so what? And I said, no, dad, seriously, George Best knows my name. So that, when we talk about players, when you talk to different generations about players, I mean, Craig's will probably harp on about Stanley Matthews at the minute. <laughs> when, when we talk about players, we talk about our generation. So when I used to talk to, say, Harry Redknapp about a player, he said to me, the best player he ever said like ever seen live was George Best. Mm. And pretty much all that era I spoke to about who was the best player you played against, it was always George Best. You know, because um, he was more class. But my era, you know, that type of player I was up against was like the Zolas, the Cantonas, you know, some very good English players in there as well, you know, really good, really good players. From my era, that when we talk about the game today, they would easily fit it into the, the, the modern game by a shadow of a doubt. Mm. I mean, you, Craig, you look at I me and you've spoken numerous cases about that Liverpool team in the late 70s and early 80s. What a team that was. Mm. You know, you're trying to tell me that, you know, Graham Souness or Sooners, yeah. Terry McDermott, McDermott yeah. wouldn't play in the modern game today? Yeah. You know? 
yeah. would it be, what would it be for you then, Craig? Best player you've seen live? Um, from yesteryear, so to speak, Graham Souness, who we just touched on, but the modern day Graham Souness, who I think just lifted it to another level for you, from an all round perspective, it has to be Stevie G. And, yeah, good player. And best live performance would probably be only from an emotional point of view. Um, last minute winner against that man, or the uh, equaliser against that man's team down below at uh, the Millennium Stadium in the FA Cup final. That just typified what he was all about. Mm. Mm. About the times, he, unfortunately, he played in a Liverpool team that was without him very average, very average. And he made it into a, a decent team. Um, him and Carragher and one or two others, but ultimately him. To, to put him in today's team um, would be frightening, I think, that type of person. Yeah. I always thought he, Craig, I also he never got enough, he never got enough credit. Alonso, the boy he played yeah. off centre, yeah. and I thought he was a very good player. And when Liverpool sold him to Real Madrid. Yeah. You know, yeah. I... You know, a club like Liverpool shouldn't be selling them type of players, you know, at that time. Yeah. He was a good player as well. Mm. Okay, and then obviously you've got your Slavan shirt behind you, Keith, and your shirt as well. Yep. Yeah. Um, that that top layer was against Turkey over in um, Galatasaray's ground. What an atmosphere that was that night. And Slavin, obviously I never played against Croatia, but when I got back to the, the ground, when we got back into the training ground one day, Slavin said, may I can have one of your taps? And I said, obviously I'll swap it. Yeah. So we kept, they got me that tap, brought it into training, they gave it to me. And I was always for, I was always saying, oh, I'm going to go over the training ground and get Slavin to sign it, and he was manager. Typical me. Didn't do it, didn't do it, couldn't, couldn't be bothered. And then about a week before he got the sack, I was going to go over and do it, not knowing that he got the sack, and then he got the sack. Mm. So I never got him to sign it for me, but it's a nice memento, you know. It's like, I, it's like I've said to my boys, you know, these little bits I've got just kind of reminds my two boys that actually I wasn't a bad player once, you know. And, and it's nice to reminisce about the good stuff, you know, especially going through this time. So I thought I'll stick a few of the tops up. So these young man's like Harry Gibbs and who's a stat stat oh, he'd probably look that top up. But for these young lads, just a little reminder that actually the 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 fellow he looks after was the bad player. <laughs> Here's Tim Breaker. Oh, that looks a decent cross. Roland! Keith Rowland for West Ham in 22 minutes. Uh, would you believe Johansson though he's given it away to Hawk. Michael Hughes. Roland finds Lennon. Good chance here. Keith Rowland. Drills it in. It's in the corner. Keith Rowland 